Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's global webinar on ESG and defining the future of sustainable finance. To introduce myself, I am Olaf Clemens, partner and global ESG practice lead at Capco. As we all recognize, mounting pressure from governments, regulators, industries, investors, as well as customers, both retail and corporate, has driven ESG to the very top of today's business agenda. It is clear, ESG is no longer a nice to have, but a complex undertaking that has the potential to transform corporate operating models. And as, a, as recent events have underlined, already allegations of mislabeling or greenwashing products present a potential threat as companies and society look to recalibrate towards the new ESG re, uh, reality. To use an automotive metaphor, the financial services industry acts as a transmission belt for this ESG engine of change, transferring intent into action. As such, financial services have a significant leadership role to play, given its position at the heart of global payment, financing and investment activity. At Capco, our focus is on supporting the financial services industry in navigating their sustainable finance journeys. Today's webinar, which follows our two previous events, looking at both the big picture ESG challenges and the more specific issues of data in the ESG space, addresses another key part of the emerging ESG equation, namely risk management. The approach adopted by firms towards ESG and related risks is evolving. Currently, many firms see ESG risk as somewhat ill-defined and hard to pin down, falling within their strategic risk or capital and liquidity management processes. However, in time, the expectation is that ESG risk will come to be viewed as a transverse risk, cutting across different risk categories, such as operational, market, credit, liquidity, or conduct risk. What then does ESG mean for an asset manager's current and longer-term strategies? How should sustainability risks and the different facets of E, S, and G be integrated into the risk management framework? How do E, S, and G risk factors affect risk management, reporting, measurement, stress testing, and reporting? What data is required? And importantly, what data is actually available? And how can ESG risks be scored and quantified? What are the required next steps to ensure compliance with key global regulatory requirements? These are some of the questions we look to answer today via our expert panelists. Before we introduce the panel, a reminder that this webinar is being recorded for subsequent publication and promotion. We would like to make this webinar as interactive as possible. Therefore, I would encourage you to use the chat function in our GoToWebinar application. Please send us your questions and remarks via chat. We will do our very best to cover as many of your questions as possible during our Q&A session. It's my pleasure now to introduce you to my co-host today, Harald Lander of Simmons & Simmons. Harald, over to you. Thank you um, very much, Olaf, and thanks to everyone joining this afternoon. Um, my name is Harald Lander. I'm a partner at Simmons & Simmons in the Frankfurt office, and my specialist areas are financial services and uh, funds regulation. So with our international team, uh, we advise our client asset managers and banks on their legal challenges um, that they face in relation to ESG, in particular, of course, over the last two years on implementation of the SFDR and the like. Um, of course, that goes both from a compliance perspective but also from a product and product structuring perspective. I think the topic of today is of uh, highly of high relevance for, um, for the whole financial services industry, and it's a great pressure now to um, introduce um, the first uh, two of our panelists. Um, let's start with uh, Anna. Anna Sophie Herken is uh, the business division head at Allianz Asset Management and as part of that role, also covering ESG finance. Anna brings more than 20 years of ESG-related practice and exposure across sectors and industries. 
Amongst others, she's a member of the board of Allianz Live in the USA. And previously, Anna held senior positions at the World Bank in Washington, D.C. and at the European Bank for Restructuring and Development. Anna, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for joining. Secondly, I would like to introduce Johan von Divendijk, head of CUSO Market and Treasury Risk Control at UBS. Johan and his team are responsible for the development and implementation of the bank's overall climate risk framework. That includes stress testing. As part of this build out, Johan's team is also responsible for ensuring that the business lines have proper risk identification and management practices in place. Thank you for joining us this morning. I think you're joining from New York. Our third and final panelist is David Koenig, President and Chief Executive Officer of the BCRO Institute. The Institute focuses on the practical, positive governance of risk-taking in pursuit of corporate goals and purpose, bringing risk governance expertise to the boardroom and C-suite. David has served amongst others as a chief executive officer. He created corporate risk management programs at three different companies and has managed complex financial portfolios in excess of tens of billions of dollars in size. Also from my end, a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us. Thank you. David, if I may direct our first question to you. Considering your background and the risk horizon for wider ESG issues, looking beyond just the climate focus, how do you see boards, management boards, supervisory boards, the C-suite, dealing with the shorter term view of shareholder value creation and how do you see them approaching the longer term nature of ESG and climate risk? Yeah, it, you're kind of getting at this, this I shouldn't say emerging debate, but certainly one that's taken on more uh, focus, which is, is there a difference between shareholder interests and stakeholder interests or interests of a wider community? I think one of the things that's really important to remember, most companies don't have stock prices. So most boards of directors aren't worried about that from a day-to-day -day basis. And the companies, obviously, they're in these uh, investment portfolios do. But when you think about the broader uh, realm of what boards do, most of them are long-term focused when they're able to be. Um, and, and when I say when they're able to be, there are a number of things that are required in order to be able to be long-term focused. But, but I think it's important to remember that they do come into that environment with that mindset, that they're trying to create long-term value. And one of the things that's happened recently, um, and, and part of what we're talking about today is, is pushing that, is a change in focus from capital being just financial. So most of us who uh, did our schooling back in the 1980s, which will date me, uh, and I think still today, there's a focus on equity and debt and the capital structure uh, of an organization being limited to that financial structure. But there's a much greater emphasis, and in, in not just because of the pandemic, but on things like human capital and technological capital and intellectual capital. And one of the things that I talk about that you don't really hear mentioned a lot is something called freedom capital, or I call it freedom capital, which is really a license to operate. So when we think about all the people that are able to affect the long-term value of an organization, one of the groups we leave out are regulators. And we know they have an impact on the organization. But what they can do is to constrict the value of that freedom capital, the ability to do what we're trying to set out to do. All of those capital providers that I mentioned, um, whether it's employees, all these people we call stakeholders, they really are just capital providers. And I think one of the things that boards don't focus on enough, but they're getting there, is this notion that the cost of all of these forms of capital is greatly influenced by how these entities perceive us. And that cost of capital probably drives the value of an organization greater than, than anything else we focus on. So it's, it's kind of strange that that's been ignored or not talked about as much. And the last thing I wanna talk about is a big change that's taking place in how boards function. And this really has to do with greater specialization. And this is where I think things like the ESG debate or ESG focus um, are helping to push things along. So there are now technical specializations that we see people asking for in human capital, risk, which is where we tend to focus, uh, technological capital, environmental social governance, um, you name it. 
But this means then that boards have greater responsibility, they have greater expectations, and it's probably going to push more transparency. So for boards now, with all of these outside parties looking in, the focus is going to be forced to the long term. And then I think some of what we'll talk about today is how can they do that? Do we have the data? Do we have the ability to help them focus on that? So I, I would say boards are focused in the right place. Um, and it's a matter of really getting some of the tools to them to help them make the right decisions. Thank you, um, David, for that. Um, turning maybe a little bit to the, yeah, um, what we think ESG risk is, is at all. In uh, 2019, the German regulator issued a sort of statement uh, that basically they said, well, uh, we think everyone, all the institutions we supervise should basically integrate ESG risk, sustainability risk as a as sort of, as, as always into their sort of normal risk management processes. And it's just a part of the normal risk management. And then obviously issued a lot of uh, sort of additional um, sort of requirements to that. But Anna, a general question uh, to, to you. Would you agree um, with the view that ESG risks and opportunities are already being like factored into the institution's decision makings around risk management and that sustainable finance is maybe just a new name for an already well-established practice? But would you also share some of your thoughts in relation to the opportunities, please? Yeah, thank you, Harald. Actually, I was just noting that you referred to 2019 and actually our youngs. I was actually quite quite uh, interesting to hear, see that we in 2005 came up with the first climate strategy, and I think this is, puts it into context because we are not only a big asset manager, we are also an insurance company, so we always look at risk certainly, but also really try to understand long-term trends, and this is why we started really looking at climate risk in 2005, and certainly try to update it annually but this is why this is really sort of something which we've done for a very long time and what we also did is we always try to not look at sustainability and the associated risk in silo but really try to integrate it horizontally into all decision making processes into all business lines so if you ask me if it's new i would say no for us not it's quite old what is new, I would say, are three trends that I see. One is certainly that with climate risk, it's we are getting used to risk, which is so difficult to quantify, and it's sort of impacting everything, I mean, like everything we do, all, all areas in life. And arising from this, what I also see is a shift, not only from risk, I mean, we certainly look at risk, but trying to be able to manage uncertainty in a much better way, and also respond and act more quickly to new developments because that's something that i think has changed and then one aspect certainly and that's my favorite topic always <laughs> is esg opportunity we are really and we're talking about this my understanding is later today really trying to address and see esg not only as a limiting factor but really see it as a business part and and look at the opportunities arising from this thank you so much for this anna but we will come to this once again in a second but also again to you Germany, the Eurozone, the UK, the US and many other countries are seeing rising consumer prices and record inflation, we have to say. The reasons are manifold and just to name a few, the loose monetary policy for many years, the fallout from the pandemic and the associated disruption to global supply chains, the Ukraine conflict, these all play a role here. Anna, from your point of view, what will this mean for the national and international efforts to attain the Uni United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? Um, yeah, thank you. I, mean, I, I think all the developments you mentioned have caused significant headwinds in all regards. I mean, like the pandemic and the invasion to Ukraine have shifted priorities in so many countries, I mean, like more defense spending, humanitarian aid, but also certainly um, having to deal with the rising energy prices. So I think you see a shift, which is likely to have very negative impact on financing the SDGs, on the green agenda, but also on financing flows from the global north to the global south. So I think like my first reaction would be saying that we're really having, seeing negative impact. On the other hand, I think that we really also see that there's a threat that we will go back in what we reached on the SDGs. That's definitely a serious threat. 
And we see this conflict between a pressing urgency to reach SDGs, which range from poverty reduction to environmental targets, while at the same time we have a constraint on public budgets and um, development aid is cut down. So, on the other hand, this means that while the public sector will not be able to fund the SDGs and is sort of facing more and more limits, it really enhances the role that we have as private sector, but in particularly certainly as a financial industry player. And again, this is something where we have a large role to play and responsibility, but also this is again leading to opportunities that we will see from the net zero transition anyway. Thank you. Um, Johan, in the current complex and turbulent geopolitical landscape, how do you picture the ESG agenda being affected by global politics and the ownership and reliance on oil and gas? As you are working for a Swiss-based global bank out of New York, I'm sure you are looking at this from very different angles and facets. Uh, we are. As you mentioned, there are many moving parts to the overall uh, landscape and what we see unfolding before us. I think when I break this down, I see it as three key components. The first is Europe and the U.S. will still need to lead efforts in the ESG space. I think overall the standard setting and how this progresses forward is still very much in its infancy, despite all of the number of conferences, all of the work that's been put into this. We're just now starting to get to a point of action across the broader financial system and to look at the current environment and say, oh, well, we've had a single disruption let's you know, call it off or, or rethink the work that's been done, we have to realize we're really just starting to implement frameworks. We're starting to think about transfer pricing, those key aspects. So it's important to stay resolute. And for the, you know, I think the firms operating out of those areas and the regulators to focus on upholding that standard. The second piece is around emerging markets. Emerging markets due to infrastructure and, and another, a number of other variables will always have high demand for hydrocarbons, right? It's a, I think, a necessity of growing those areas and, and moving from uh, emerging to more developed spaces, right? If you look at the energy output of a hydrocarbon relative to other forms of energy, we, as we see it, you have more independence in today's environment until we see innovation catching up to the goals of the overall ESG landscape. So we have to realize that there's an increased uh, burden on the standards as well as the uh, risk appetite that we set in the developed world in order to allow the emerging markets to continue to grow. And the third piece is really around um, focusing on the transition. We are in a, a marathon, right? So if we look at how long it will take to achieve our goals, if we look at mid-century targets that we're trying to hit, if we look at various cuts of when uh, net zero standards have to be achieved, right? They're still not for 10 years out that we have to start hitting some of these targets, right? There is this serious lag time into building into and reducing exposure as a whole across the industries. So I look at those three pieces first and foremost for saying that's where the, you know, the current environments, that's where we need to go and the current environment shouldn't derail us from that. And the second piece around hydrocarbon ownership, and, and I tend to focus more on hydrocarbon than just oil and, and gas, I think we need to look at the, the supply chain, right? The resources sit where the resources sit, uh, but then they'll be shipped around the world for use and, and supply chains. And the question will be, again, to that idea of emerging versus developed markets, how are you creating the right financial incentives and how have you cut back risk appetite in different areas in order to drive the usage and the capacity in various markets? So that's really where I think about uh, ownership, supply chains, and 
how that plays out in in moving goods and services around uh, the globe. Thank you so much, Johan. Um, Anna, maybe once back to you. In your view, how does the conflict in Ukraine and the associated geopolitical turmoil impact the established sustainability roadmap, um, particularly in the context of rising energy prices and, and future investment? Johan just named a few topics also yeah. from, from the supply chain, of course. Will the sustainability efforts stall in the near future, or do you think they will rather accelerate so that we get swifter and more more faster than initially planned to the renewables? I mean, like the escalation of the conflict certainly had so many terrible impacts. <laughs> so it's so, but like all the human social side, which will have an impact on the sustainability agenda again. But overall, we certainly see this increased negative global trends and also the problem uh, on, on global supply chains. So I think when we look at your question, I would say we have to differentiate between the short term and then the medium longer term. So I would say that when we assess the impact on sustainability, um, when we look at the short term, we will definitely see a backlash and sort of going back, I mean, like we'll have the surge in energy demand, we'll have an increase in fossil fuel output, coal consumption, but also if you look at the technology that we need for the net zero transition, they really depend on functioning supply chains and natural resources. So short term, I think we will see sort of a complexity, a new layer of complexity. But longer term, and I'm always an optimist, I would say it's probably, <laughs> we will probably really benefit from the situation because many of the problems that we are facing now, like the supply chain and natural resources constraints, we've actually had even before the recent developments. So I think we put like a new focus on this and hopefully, due to the situation, we will work on, on faster and better solutions. So if you look at medium term, medium term, I would say it's accelerating actually green transition and, and our achievements in sustainability. Thank you. And David, what's your view here? Well, the things I kept hearing talked about all uh, are around what we call complex adaptive systems under supply chains, climate, um, our corporations. Um, you know, in, in when you introduced Johan, um, and I thought back to my days running risk departments, um, I was happy I wasn't having to deal with something as complex as climate. We just had to deal with stock market crashes and fraud and and uh, foreign exchange volatility. It was much, much more simple problems than what you're having to deal with. But one of the good things is that there is an emerging understanding of how complex systems work. And, and for those on the call who are not familiar yet with the Santa Fe Institute, um, I'll direct you out there. But that work's been going on for, I think, over 30 years. Um, a real interesting work on understanding how all of these systems interact with each other. And, and supply chains, again, um, that was one that was mentioned. Um, they weren't noticed as much because they worked so well. And once they stopped working well, people paid attention to them. Climate is another system that people haven't noticed as much because it's generally worked well. Now in some places it's not working so well, so we're seeing it. And there's, there's a, getting back to the comment I made at the beginning, helping boards to understand this is a matter of helping them see it and understand it. And so Johan's work and Anna's work, this is really critical um, to help people see what's in front of them. Um, geopolitics, another complex adaptive system. And in, in one thing we know about complex adaptive systems is that they tend to go through what are transitions from temporary equilibrium. And I, I apologize if that's uh, uh, too abstract a term, but in a geopolitical sense, we've lived in that since the fall of the wall. And what we're going through right now feels very much like just the beginning of one of those transitions. And those transition periods can be incredibly volatile. The climate one is most likely to be incredibly volatile and probably much longer lasting than even the geopolitical, but the two of them intersect with each other. And that's the thing I think that makes part of Johan's and Anna's work so challenging right now is that amplification of risks, most people don't appreciate just how far those can go beyond what you might expect. Um, and so I think that's, again, another thing for bringing to boards and executives is to understand where risks intersect with each other and can amplify. And, and this last um, set of answers uh, helped highlight some of those uh, really important areas. Thank you. Um, maybe coming back to that, uh, I think, very interesting theme of opportunity and uh, complexity. Yeah? 
I mean, just from from our perspective as uh, as as lawyers in the ESG uh, regulatory space, I mean, it has so much opportunities for our clients uh, to set up new uh, products, um, but. Um, the complexity that lies within there and the challenges are really also driven by um, by regulation um, that is now coming uh, in, into force uh, and that is not always easy to um, to, to see through. Um, but Anna, maybe on a more global um, uh, level or high, higher level, um, how do you see financial services firm dealing with the complexity in this opportunities space currently? I mean, we certainly see that ESG has become such a trend that we really have to look at opportunities. And we are having like such a high number of new products and services. So I can just give you an example of what we did, for example. What we did is we really looked at an ESG challenge. So let's let's say we took the net zero target and we sat down with consulting firms. We just said, okay, we want to understand what does it actually not only mean in constraints and all this regulatory constraints, but what does it mean in terms of opportunities? And we broke it down and we said that uh, this reaching global net zero economy by 2050 re requires about 275 trillion USD, US dollars, capex investments. And then we just said, okay, that's really far away in 2050. So let's look at 2030. That's a bit more tangible for us lawyers and number crunchers. So we said, okay, let's look at this. So we broke this down. We said, if you just look at the four largest regions and the four main sectors for net zero, agriculture, buildings, power mobility, this accounts to 40 trillion US dollars by 2030. And then we try to sort of put a, like, look at, okay, what will be the public sector financing and what will be left for us asset managers? And we just came to about 4.7 to 6 trillion US dollars capex total investment need just for asset managers by 2030. Mm. And we sat down and really sort of strategically broke it down by region, by, by sector, and we tried to really look at where can we fit in, what's the opportunity there. So that was sort of the first bucket. And then we also tried to look at the other two buckets, which is data, because we all know about all these data problems. Whenever you have a problem, and one day you hopefully have a solution and we want to be part of that. So this is something where we also looked at the data bucket. And then at the third bucket, which is advisory. So all the advisory service around ESG. So this is sort of how we try to structure the complexity of ESG and translate it into opportunities. Thank you so much. Um, Johan, um, the traditional views of risk and reward in the financial services context typically look at the likelihood and severity of risk. However, comprehensive ESG risk analysis incorporates a range of risks and different facets of E, S, and G that have, nev that have never before manifested in the same manner or severity. How do we plan for risks in a new world of ESG when they have simply not been seen before? It's uh, it's obviously a very complicated question, and, and both David and Anna spoke to aspects of this in, in some of their previous answers. I mean, for me, I try to take a step back, and if I look broadly at uh, you know the financial crisis, or if I look at COVID, or I look at aspects like that, and I look at the journalism around those events, depending on whose article you pick up, those events either had happened historically or they hadn't ever happened historically right and and why do i use that as barometer well we all know that we build models and models are supposed to have probability as as you said for predictive outcomes and we anchor it to those historical events but the reality of the situation is history will never fully repeat itself as david mentioned you know if we look through time there's been different bats of uh, globalization, right? And global free trade and, and how that's impacted us as a civilization. If we take that a step further and we say, okay, we know things have and flow. We know that we hit points of equilibrium and then we go dis, uh, disjunct and we have rising opportunities and the associated costs, et cetera. What is it that we need to see? At the end of the day, I think about it as a data question. 
how much transparency do I have in the activities that I'm taking, right? It's about being able to understand my portfolios, understand the products I've sold, the optionality that's been given to clients or given to me, right, as, as an organization and being able to aggregate that information. With that information then, uh, and I think this is one area where the industry and the regulators have, have thought through this pretty well in running a suite of uh, stress scenarios, right? What happens if I hit the mid-century targets? What happens if I hit them, but I was late in reacting? What happens if I hit them early? What happens if I never hit them? All those types of factors. Well, what does that allow me to see? If I have good data quality and I have transparency, I can see how nonlinear my risk is in different portfolios. If you ask me today, I would say that in the industry, you see a lot of shorter term contracts where perhaps the optionality is um, low. But as we move through time and ESG becomes a more developed product, right? Optionality will become high. Mm -hmm. And whenever you start to get that higher optionality uh, embedded in the market, right? That's where you start to see more nonlinear risk and you start to see bigger uh, fallout around that because people look for some type of arbitrage in temporary pricing or, or factors of that nature. So the most critical thing you can do is be implementing frameworks for quality data capture. You will not have perfect data today. You can't expect to have that as a, as a goal. It's unrealistic. But what you need to do is implement a framework that drives you towards um, getting transparency. Then what you can do is you can take, you know, today, you can take broad swings at, okay, where are the biggest gaps in my data? Okay, it's here. All right, we'll make a broad assumption that, uh, and, and we know what the output of that assumption should be in our models, and we'll run our models and we'll see what comes out. The output either aligns with expectations or doesn't align, right? Which means you have something that works or you have something that doesn't work, and you reinforce the system by being, you know, reiterative. And I think that's really the most important thing for us to do today is get away from the idea of I have a good probability of what will occur. And instead, I have good transparency as to what the risk that I'm running is. Because as we talk about this, it is a developing, it's an emerging risk. Uh, it will transition over time as different pockets become more uh, entrenched as innovation. Uh, you know, advances, what will you see? You will see the ability to hedge off your risk, right? So today you might have a large concentration, but in the future you could hedge that down be through uh, technological innovation that will come about if we do this right, which is transfer price, the, the risk, right? And so you want to be able to, if you can see the risk, then you can manage the risk dynamically. That's really my view. And, um, the, the last piece I'll say around that really comes into uh, setting risk appetite. <clears throat> and, and for me, this is critical because when we look at things today, we would say, okay, probabilities will tell us, look at the credit risk associated with a, an outcome. And you would say, well, I have this company. It has, it's called Exxon Mobil. They have a long positive financial record, they've got great uh, earnings. Uh, what's the risk that something happens causing them to not achieve making their, their debt payments? Very little, right? Um, even with uh, a limited uh, market on the horizon, right? They have been pivoting their strategy starting years ago to a firm that is focused on energy as opposed to just hydrocarbons. So I'm going to underwrite that as perhaps a low risk. Then I have some other company who's focused on saying, well, our goal is to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and to put it into concrete and use that concrete to develop uh, houses, to build buildings, etc. Okay, great idea. Much more ESG friendly on the surface than a hydrocarbon based company. Um, unproven technology, so to speak, or less sustainable. 
how are you going to underwrite that? You're going to almost come out with this thing that even when you tip the scales for ESG, Exxon may still have an advantage in the short term. And so when you look at your risk appetite, right, at the end of the day, supporting a transition to an ESG future will require our firms to set aside, in my mind, more capital to be able to bank or support those ESG innovations, right, in the short term. And, and how are you going to do that? You need to have good data to be able to see that risk, right, in order to create capacity because, you know, while David's right, those of us who, who are very much focused on a hey, uh, financial balance sheet and, and capital as a resource, that's what people understand. That's what they can measure. And it's a limited commodity. So <clears throat> we have to, you know, manage around. That's how I, I see this pointing out. Thank you, Johan. I think that that really nicely segues into um, the, the next question, which is around uh, ESG target settings and um, yeah, uh, risk management thereof. So, I mean, the direction setting of ESG targets can also, let's say, as, as you mentioned, uh, Johan, complicate uh, risk thinking. And uh, the example that um, uh, was mentioned earlier by, by Anna is that, for instance, like um, uh, committing to uh, certain targets like capping global temperature rise to 1.5 uh, degrees or the like. So, um, but uh, David, uh, US advice uh, boards, yeah, and from your point of view, uh, are those boards now fully aware of what it takes to integrate these ESG commitments into the day to day operations? Um, and also, if you could allude to that, what, what Johan just said, um, with the re re related data requirements or lack of the data that is available. Yeah, if I answer yes to that, you'd be right to cut me off right now and just go to Johan and Anna. Um, I, I think the comments that Johan and Anna have made are really helpful, um, and, and I hope everyone's taking those to heart. You know, we don't know what this means in terms of the way in which the atmosphere and the environment is changing. We don't know what this means in terms of how the geopolitical environment is changing. We don't know how those interact because none of us have been through a combination like this. We don't have history to go back to. We don't have stories from our elders. We just don't have this. And so in many ways, what we're having to do is to create a mental picture. And one of the things we know is that we're really bad at creating these mental pictures. It just doesn't work well in our brains. So, you know, Johan's comment about trying to help get data, I think goes back to the, to the start of what I was saying is that in order for boards to make good decisions, they do need to have transparency into what they're doing. The challenge is framing it in a way, and this gets to what Anna was saying, about opportunities. So really when you're a board, you're not, you, know, you don't want to come into every board meeting and talk about everything that can go wrong. That's just not your nature. The people who are on boards have been successful in their careers. They've been ch achieving things. That's why they're there. So beginning from this point of saying, what is it that success looks like? And that's different for every company. But beginning with what success looks like means that then you can start working backwards to understand what the drivers are of that success and then the drivers of those drivers. And really what you're trying to get back to is something you know, referred to as first principles. And when you can start understanding first principles, then you can start applying risk management and risk governance techniques to those first principles. One of the um, things I think that, that um, is helpful is to know that when people are confronted with something that they haven't seen before, it tends to turn on an emotional reaction. And so this emotional reaction typically is defensive. There's another, um, or two, two researchers, Elke Weber and Paul Slovak, who've done a nice job looking at risks that can amplify and then the emotional impacts of, of these things happening. And what they've discovered is that there are two factors that contribute to an amplification. One is the level of dread. In other words, how much do we fear something? Can it hurt me physically? So the subprime crisis could hurt me financially. The environment might hurt me physically, might hurt me financially. Um, and the other one is knowledge or lack of knowledge. And this again gets to what Johan was saying. If you have high dread and high lack of knowledge, 
you're much more likely to respond in a protective defensive manner, which means you'll ignore the opportunities that Anna was talking about. You only need to address one of those two factors to interrupt that amplification. And so, you know, Johan's approach on this to say that, that getting, the trans, or getting the transparency, getting the data, helping people make these decisions better can actually help boards be more effective. They don't necessarily have to know exactly what can happen. But if they set up the structures and they can make long-term decisions that are designed to respond to things that they didn't expect, then you can achieve that success. Then you can more ably pursue the opportunities that Anna had talked about. I hope that addresses it, but I, I thought it was important what the two of them had said. Yeah, but that nicely, I, I, I think David plays it back to, um, to Johan. Um, so, I mean, what David just uh, talked about and these sort of somewhat uh, often uh, not very certain or nebulous status of, of these uh, circumstances, how do we put that into hard controls, metrics um, or decision making uh, processes? Um, and again, I mean, we mentioned the data, data problem, you mentioned it. Um, if there's anything you can allude to that point as well. Certainly, as um, as David mentioned, it's um, it's not no it's not about knowing absolutes. It's about understanding potential ramifications. So, uh, for myself in the risk function, I see our primary goal as being able to play back to each business. Here's what here's how we think about the risks associated with your business right and your products here's how we can make transparent what it is you're actually doing with every time you engage with a client right and then that empowers the business to be able to say okay now i understand if i do this this is the risk if i do this this is the risk these are the scenarios you've used to try to put the boundaries to the potential outcomes and now they actually have the information needed to make effective decisions in which activities they want to pursue and how they want to present opportunities up to management to to the board or back to risk in terms of asking for approvals to engage in certain activities and ultimately it facilitates a strong discussion in allowing the, the businesses who are the ones who deal with clients and ultimately will be the ones to shepherd uh, the transition in the marketplace, right? Here's how you need to start, you know, thinking about this risk and what, you know, your role is. And, and so that's where I start. So ground zero, transparency to the business. Here's how we've measured the risk. Here's how we get there. Here's how you can see it on a regular basis. Then the second piece is obviously coming to the difficult uh, decision. How much risk can I take in this space, right? How much available capital do I have? How have I sized this as a whole? Are there risks that I would deprioritize in order to take more risk here? Or do I want to be very tightly controlled in this space and, and offload it? One of the, the key pieces for, for me in all of this is the dynamic that will unfold between um, traditional financial services organizations and insurers, right? And uh, Anna had mentioned this earlier in the in the call or in in the discussion around insurance. That is a big piece, right? It, it had a very finite view in the you know in the prior world to ESG. And how it unfolds in the future is very different because it, while it may have always been a hedging strategy, it may be much more of a hedge strategy in the future. And those who sell insurance uh, for this risk, which is much more difficult to quantify or, or understand how it could potentially play out, there's a serious cost there. And as those costs go up, right, then it comes back to are you going to buy the insurance or are you going to ride the risk and how does that feed back into your risk appetite right and so it's about again creating a structure that is open transparent and allows flow of communication to be reiterative that's that's you know ultimately the goal 
and then you put your hard barriers up where where you see uh, you see the consumption at the end of the day, right? And today we'll set them somewhere and we'll see what works and what doesn't and tomorrow we'll set them somewhere else, right? That, that'll be the, the result, I think. So I'm sure we will see some more developments to come over the next years. But David, um, we've been looking at the macro view of the risk to financial services firms and the considerations for policy and approach. Shifting gear to looking to the markets and how we value a business, do you think the efficient market has valued in ESG risks into pricing theories such as CAPM and option pricing models? <laughs> well, ha having done my graduate work in the mid 1980s, which was when the efficient market hypothesis and rational expectations in the Chicago School of Thought and Economics were dominating, and and I was doing my schooling at Northwestern, so we were we were certainly influenced by that Chicago school of thinking. Um, my first work was in the financial markets after graduate school, and it wasn't long before I realized that much of what I'd been taught about those efficient markets really wasn't true in practice. Um, markets are emotional, people are emotional, risk is an emotion. And so one of the most interesting things, you know, I've talked about this before, is this, this idea of how things amplify and the, and the complexity of the relationships we've got. So the question back to whether this stuff is priced in, what I would say is just as it's almost impossible for boards to be able to fully understand the implications of, of uh, targeting some of these things that, that uh, we've talked about, it's almost impossible for the markets to fully understand the impact of an organization's risk profile. So this goes back probably about um, 13 years ago. I started building something called trust ratings because one of the things that factors in, and again, this is something I mentioned early on, um, in, in the value of anything, so the value of a company, um, it's not just based on what you expect to get in, let's say, dividends, for example, or how long you're gonna get those dividends it's really the likelihood that you're going to be disappointed. And that denominator, that's the discount factor. That's something that, you know, people really don't appreciate how much emotion plays a role in that and how much the emotion of surprise or disappointment plays a role in that. So I, in, in, in building these trust ratings, the goal was to say, what can we find out about companies looking at ESG factors, financial reporting, all sorts of other factors that indicates that they should be trusted? And of course, the next question, because it's an asset management question, is has the market figured that out? So we also created something called a market implied governance metric. My theme was on governance because my, my sense is ESG is a subset of G, not, not the other way around. It's how you live as an organization. And then we created something called sustainable value grades. And we assigned letter grades like you'd get in school to those. And you know, somewhere around 20% of the companies received Ds and Fs in terms of sustainable value grades. And, and basically what that was saying is the market doesn't understand the risk profile that these companies are bringing forward. And I don't think markets or people are any better at predicting risk today in the future than they were back then. At the same time as data gets better, we can get a little bit better at doing this. So, so it's a very long answer to say, I don't think it's possible for the efficient market to work. Um, it works pretty well. You know, 80% of the companies maybe are priced well in that way, but there's still in almost every portfolio that exists out there, uh, a, a significant number of companies that are not accurately, their risk is not accurately captured. Um, and so the question I think gets back to CAPM. Well, one of the problems with CAPM is that it's backward looking. You know, it, it, it relies on past risk relationships. Everything about risk is forward looking. We have this conversation about where risk should be governed at the board level. Audit committees often are called audit and risk committees, but audit committees are about looking backward and validating. So there's the parallel there when risk is forward looking and anticipatory. So we get into this really difficult situation again of saying what truly does the future distribution of outcomes look like? And then the real role for a board, and this is where those governance factors come in and, and the ESG factors come in uh, and the transparency come in, is, is the board structuring the organization or is the board encouraging management to structure the organization so that it can change the shape of the future? Is it able to respond to surprises on the downside so that we truncate the downside of the distribution? 
is it doing things like looking for opportunities, like Anna had mentioned, and innovating so that it can extend the upside? And our modeling of options, and this goes way back to the, to the late 70s and early 80s, when you start throwing in skewed distributions, you really get some strange outcomes in the, in the traditional option models. Early in those days, we used to do things what are called volatility smiles to fix some of the problems in, in, in option modeling. But boards are also dealing with real options. That's, that's the thing they're trying to value. So uh, you know, we wanna get this stuff priced in as best we can, uh, but, but really in looking at the companies that you're lending to or investing in, the question is, how are you structured to enhance the upside of the future and how are you structured to respond to what you didn't expect on the downside? Uh, and that's when I'll believe that things are priced in well. Thank you. Um, and Anna, from the perspective of an asset manager and an insurer, what do you think presents, let's say, the bigger challenge for Allianz, investing in sustainable assets or products or rather in unsustainable assets? That's a good question. <laughs> um, if I take my opportunity glasses on again, I would first say we expect ESG AUM to double within the next five years. And I just alluded to all the opportunities arising from that zero transition. So I would say basically we, 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 we see, I would always link ESG more to opportunity than challenge. However, we certainly have lots of challenges. And, and David and Jörn alluded, for example, to the data point, but also just going back to the taxonomy discussion in Europe, I mean, like, how do we agree on what's sustainable? I mean, like taking nuclear power, that's sort of unsolved and we're a global payer, player, so it's even more difficult. And we have all these very different client demands um, depending on regions and very different reporting requirements. So there are tons of challenges. On the other hand, I look at all these asset managers and us being one of them, being very successful in the ESG space, I would say um, just, doing sustainable finance and sustainable investing is not really a challenge looking at the unsustainable investment we don't do that what we do is certainly transition investment and that's also something that Johan explained earlier so we really believe that if we want to sort of support the transition to a low carbon economy we also have to sort of work with investors and help them to sort of develop from going to from a brown state to a green state and this is why this is a space where we are active, certainly, and that has its own challenges. But um, we believe that by investing into like transition from brown to green, that's such a huge, vast impact that we also do that. So coming back to that, we don't do unsustainable investing. We do transit and sustainable investing, and they both have their challenges, but still you can be successful in that space. Thank you. And in this in this space, um, do you think that there are also these opportunities, or yeah, these opportunities which are challenging or promising in terms of creating incremental value? And how do you think to capitalize on these ESG value creation opportunities? I just said yeah, there are so many, and this is sort of like just looking at one aspect, which is net zero, and then you have so many more environment themes and social and governance. So just so breaking them down and trying to translate them into sort of opportunities, I think that's sort of the right approach and that's what we've been doing. You certainly have a downside. If you look at just, again, the net zero transition, you will have lots of stranded assets and impairments and all that. But on the other hand, if you really sort of try to incorporate it into your business early and think about transition, you will also limit physical risk, transit transition risk, so you will sort of I think have more upside than downside. And this is why we really see that there are lots of good opportunities. And, and it's, it's certainly, I mean, like, and that comes back, I think also to your point, David, certainly even when you look at opportunities, not only risk, you really have to sort of be quick to adapt. So what we define as an opportunity today might look different in three or five years, but um, I think combination of quick reaction and good planning and trying to think ahead, it's hopefully the way to, to be successful. Coming back, and um, that is really a nice uh, segue again uh, to the sort of uh, risk and uh, reward and uh, ESG. I mean, there was, uh, and it was mentioned earlier, the case of, of course of Exxon, um, but I read an article that there was an active ESG investor into into that company um, that, that lobbied hard for a change to more uh, sustainability. And um, when questioned, he basically said, well, the, the sort of, 
primary focus of this was a pure risk and return profile rather than um, sort of doing good for a green environment, which is obviously a positive uh, side effect. Um, but on, on that term, I mean, if you look at um, longer term valuations, if we move through 10 years, uh, 20 years ahead, um, there will be, as, as Anna said, many ESG related business opportunities. Um, but obviously we need to direct the capital flows right. We need to maintain good investment discipline and get the uh, risk management right. So maybe nice question uh, for you, Johan. Um, how can we avoid um, sort of green green ESG bubbles that uh, then eventually burst and uh, obviously uh, lead, lead to a negative uh, long-term impact on exactly that capital flow? Uh, uh. Again, with many of these questions, I think it's very complex as much as I try to, you know, streamline how I would solve for it. Um, I think first, you know, kind of first principles is the best place to start, which is how are you developing and projecting your cash flows, right? One thing that worries me broadly about the markets when I look across the board is if I look at the people who are active in the markets today and I look at the experience, how many of them have spent a career trading upward moving Fed funds? How many of them have been in their seats for uh, where the primary growth companies were uh, physical producers of goods, right? Uh, durable goods, et cetera, versus many of the companies being high tech, very scalable type technology that's being launched. And, and why is that fundamental? Well, one, we can talk about inflation. We can talk about the rise of, of rates. That aside, we know that transfer pricing, climate risk will come at a cost borne out in in the rates, right? The second piece is you're going to see a shift in the incentive to innovate away from scalable high tech to producers, right? It has to be about manufacturing. It has to be more about the the less sexy side of business, if you will, the uh, you know nuts and bolts of producing, of agriculture, of supply chains, all of those pieces. That's really where we're going back to. So who has a technical expertise in projecting cash flows for those types of business models is going to be one of the first places I look. And anybody who hasn't trained themselves up, hasn't built an understanding of those business models of using dynamic assumptions, things of, of that nature, um, is going to be nothing but, in my mind, overly optimistic and using what we've seen as the idea of like, Oh, it's ESG. There's tons of money, as Arna said. You know, the amount of initial investment, the size of ESG, path, you know, portfolios will be tremendous. So you're going to have a lot of dollars chasing a few companies. So people are going to be looking for unicorns. They're going to be looking for big things. But what's going to happen? The, the payout, the scalability, it's not going to be there in the short term. So if you're buying these companies for billions of dollars, you're buying in for a return that has to be factored in over 30, 50 plus years. Now, that may be fine. Um, as a whole, we are talking about a risk that's supposed to play out over you know, those same timelines. But that's not where the world has been for the last two decades, right? And so I think this is very much a fundamental shift in the underlying mechanics of the market. And so I would push for a, you know, a move back to first principles, basic cash flow forecasting, balance sheet projections for tangible goods companies is, is the first place to look. I think the second thing to look at is going to be uh, the how these companies are funded, VC money, angel investing rounds, those types of things. Because um, going back to some of the comments from Anna and David around what is driving the capital base of these companies, right? One thing that we've seen in recent years, and I think COVID certainly spelled that out for companies that we saw take a big hit, 
was you saw these early entrants. They had big VC money behind them. VCs wanted to exit. That means big valuations. That means large IPOs to get out of those deals. Um, if you have better capital structures with uh, better funding bases using debt versus equity profiles, which is what the ESG kind of financial services, you know, governance is supposed to help push, then you have a much more sustainable transfer and you avoid bubbles is, is my view. But it comes down to a system operating as a whole and the capital markets being able to provide efficient access, right? Those are the types of things uh, that, that I look to. And then the last piece is, again, going back to one of my earlier points about distinguishing between emerging market tech and developed market tech, right? Yeah, looking at battery technology or the ability to uh, recharge EVs. We have the ability to roll infrastructure out across Europe, across the, the US. You can't do that in large swaths of the globe. The infrastructure isn't there to, to do things like that. So what you will see coming out in the form of innovation has to, it will not be as scalable, I think, in, in the short term. And that has to be understood. And that should, in and of itself, mean that your cash flow projections are small. Um, so, again, it's, it's really about fundamentals and getting back to to those cash flow forecasting basics to avoid asset bubbles. But we will certainly see, I think, bidding up of, of firm prices because people want to get into the space. They're going to give money to asset managers who are going to have you know, not a ton of companies to chase uh, on a strategy about the shepherding of companies from brown to green is going to be absolutely key in, in that space in, in interim. But uh, it's it's a piece of the pie versus the whole pie. Um, but Johan, maybe we stay for a second also in the term in terms of accompanying clients on their transition journey. A key issue for financial services will be the need, and you mentioned this already, to support clients on their transition journey, not dumping carbon intense companies, but stewarding them towards an orderly transition. How does a financial services firm manage the natural conflict, I would call it, between nudging companies toward better ESG behaviors and trading out of difficult positions? Where do you see the line between stay and go? That's a good question. For, for me, it's, it's two pieces. One is the timeline that you're looking across. We, we know that we're going to have to deliver on a number of uh, requirements over the short term that will undoubtedly use hydrocarbons as, as a source. The question is, in supporting that activity, are you funding deals that are uh, scrubbing of exhaust from a carbon perspective? Are you funding deals that are about um, buying uh, ESG credits or paying a carbon tax, something to offset the amount of externalities you're creating in the market? Or are you doing business which is purely brown, right? I think the transition, supporting the transition period is, again, to my point about risk appetite, sizing risk appetite to allow activity to be done with brown companies. Um, but you know, an emphasis on the activities being focused linked to their migration to green, right? So how are you helping them issue green bonds? How are you helping them pick up projects or funding projects in, in their capital structure that are migrating to, to green? So if you have, again, just picking on Exxon a bit, but if you have Exxon looking to raise money to do further investment in um, non-hydrocarbon energy space, right? That could be very much an area that you support and you do activity with. Uh, on the surface, it may seem brown, but it's really the underlying piece of what you're driving to support the overall global initiatives versus all you know, hydrocarbon companies are, are bad. 
because by the same uh, the same lines going the other direction, we can look at EVs and we can look at, for instance, their their fuel cells or their their battery technology. How recyclable is that material at the end? What is the average life? What is the um, success rate for the um, the bad battery, right? So of all the batteries developed, how many are good versus how many are bad? How much of that is produced using child labor? How much of that is destroying, uh, you know, uh, the protected lands? Uh, all of those factors come in, right? So people typically think on the surface, hydrocarbon companies bad, EV companies, you know, good. It's not that, that simple. You have to look at the underlying activity that's being supported have that look through, which um, is going to be critical in this, and then allowing yourself the risk appetite to support those activities that, yeah, they'll carry some cost uh, from a capital perspective, but in order to migrate the world to a new ESG world, you have to be able to support the temporary investment, otherwise you'll never get there. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Anna, you um, both have lived in Europe, Asia and the United States and obviously you um, work for a company, um, Allianz, uh, Allianz Asset Management that is active in all of these uh, three areas. Um, so, I mean, probably this would be the topic for another um, uh, 60 minutes, um, but maybe in a <laughs> very few highlighted words, um, what differences could you single out in terms of, yeah, um, regional differences between uh, uh, those areas um, or those different regions in terms of sustainability and commitment uh, to ESG? Um, I mean, I, I think I touched on this before, certainly have different interpretations of what could be an E standard or what could be a show, social standard, depending on what region you're talking about. So I think there's certainly also different client demand and, and different cultural understanding. I think what's positive is that despite the headwinds, we are seeing a lot of development on the regulatory side in all these regions. So still Europe is in the lead with all the recent activity, but then we've seen a lot of um, action from the US, I mean, like rejoining Paris, um, the SEC proposal, DOL rule on sort of integrating more ESG consideration to retirement plans. So there's a lot, I think, of positive development. Also looking into China, you're having more uh, regulatory activity. Um, you're certain, even putting standards and, and, and putting thresholds for, for greenhouse emissions. So I think this is positive that you have sort of all major regions moving forward. I think what's still the missing link is that we don't have the perfect multilateral approach because you still face three very different sets of standards. So if I would have a wish list, it would certainly be sort of rejoining and revisiting more the multilateral approach to all these challenges that we are facing. Thank you. And maybe before we come to our Q&A session, um, maybe one uh, question to all of you, but with the, with the wish, maybe for a short answer to this. If you had to name the single greatest risk facing the industry in the context of sustainability in the short and medium term, what would it be? And maybe starting again from top of the house, so the board and management board perspective, David. Well, since the perspective has to be long term, um, I think the single biggest risk is radical political flip flopping and that a lot comes down to the United States. Um, for those who don't spend their time here, um, you probably don't really recognize just how divided we are as a country right now and, and how emotionally we, we respond to people of different political views. Um, if you're trying here to invest and plan for the long run and the regime around you know climate or regulation or generally the role of government is going to change back and forth every four years, your horizon can't be long term. It has to be short term. I think that's the biggest risk we face, but but that's also a global risk. It's not just here in the States. Thank you, David. And Anna, your view? I would probably link it all back to climate since climate for me is sort of the umbrella for everything. Um, sort of if you if you sort of 
link climate to every aspect of life, you quickly end up at water scarcity, natural resources, social conflict, geopolitics. So for me, it's such a big bucket of sort of unmeasurable consequences that I would pick that one. Okay. Thank you. And last but not least, Johan, your point of view? Uh, for me, I think it's the transition risk, uh, really. What I mean by that is the, the market risk associated with pricing the assets in the short term, how that plays out. And specifically to that point, it will be the ability to look through asset classes. So if you think about ABS or if you think about ETFs or indices, right, what's sitting in those, um, those will be areas that I think will be quite shocked. Uh, as this gets played out. Right? That's the thing that worries me the most in the short term. Thank you so much. So, as said, we have the opportunity to raise also questions from the audience, and we have already received um, the first question. So, thank you for that. Um, I read it out now from a risk, per, risk and valuation perspective. We predict forward but use historic views as a basis. If not cap M or actuarial data, how do we value companies or insurance products more accurately for ESG factors if the traditional models aren't intrinsically covering the future anticipated ESG risks? Potentially in the direction of you, David, or you, Johan. Yeah, well, the very first presentation I did at a conference back in the 1990s was called How Wrong Can You Be? And it wasn't a negative, but it was a reality check on models and communicating to people just how far off your models could be helps you decide how much risk you're willing to take. So getting back to Johan's talk about risk appetite um, or tolerance for uncertainty, I think that's critical. Um, I don't believe you can accurately measure future risk. And that's a really unsettling idea for somebody who's quantitative in, in nature and, and likes to have um, those guidance uh, out there. In fact, the, the two psychologists I'd mentioned before um, say that quantification is something that we created just to give us comfort about dealing with risk. Now, that's not to say it's all wrong but it does say that we have to focus on how wrong it can be. And that's really getting to whether you can survive as an entity, whether it's a portfolio or a company um, or you know, in, in any other uh, element, you have to stay in the game. And so that's, that's, I think, one of the most important things is to try to, and this is you know, where Johan, I'm sure, has to do a lot of his work, get a sense for how wrong can your models be. Johan, anything to add from your end? I think uh, David summed it up nicely. It's it's really about understanding at the end of the day, what are you talking about from a loss perspective, right? You have a max loss estimate profile. We use probabilities to try to say what's the highest likelihood and hopefully that's less than the worst case scenario and we execute decisions based on, on that probability. For me, um, when I look at climate risk, you're not going to have anything that that you can play out, right? So it's about the scenarios helping you to understand the the borders of the of the risk or of the products that you've sold into the market. And once you know kind of the boundaries, then you go, okay, I at least understand worst case scenario. Anything less is is optimistic, and then you can reverse engineer from there which is using you, you obviously are going to take a step, but you'll say, okay, looking back historically, what interactions have I seen between these variables when the market plays out this way? And you can't look for climate risk because it hasn't happened as we discussed earlier in the call. But what we can look at is the interaction, meaning um, think of it as a multivariate equation. Your coefficients are going to change, right? And that's what you have to look for, is the idea that the model today won't be the model in the future, the coefficients will change, and that will shift out the risk, and that should bear out in what I think of as a nonlinear result. And that's what we do, try to do a lot of with our sensitivity and our scenario testing. 
and and then it's all judgment from there. As David said, you got to just be able to live with it. And uh, as I said on the call earlier, I think it's going to come down to dynamic uh, risk management. You'll find a position that at a time you thought was good, and later you'll say, nope, got to get out of this. And hopefully you have the tools that allow you to understand when to get out. And can I just, I want to uh, build on something Johan had said, and, and this is really getting back to this notion of sustainable value and, and trust, is that in making asset allocation decisions, and Anna may have some, some things to add to this too, it's not always that you have to be right, but sometimes you have to be right in a relative sense. So if you're making a choice between, and this is again what boards have to deal with, with real options, you're making a choice on where to allocate the asset. The question comes down to not, is this company in the same industry comparable to this company in the same industry? It comes down to, is this company comparable on a risk basis? And that cuts across all sorts of different dimensions. Are you being compensated for the risk of investing in that company? And this is where it gets really important into building this deeper dive into what constitutes the risk of a company. It's not backward looking, it's forward looking. It's just adding like, to the limitations that we see on the risk side, like more from the business side. This is why getting back to why it's so important that we sort of teach ourselves to deal with uncertainty much better, think in scenarios and try to really react much faster. And this is really about cultural change and has so many aspects. And that's what, what I think that's sort of what we can do from, like, more from the business aspect to try to compensate for the difficulties that we see on the, on the risk side. Maybe we go to um, to question uh, two. I, I first read it. Um, the world still needs oil. Uh, will still need oil for another 20 to 30 years or even more. So how do we move investors into green stocks when brown stocks, in theory, will increase as sort of the scarcity of the resources increases? So um, that is the question. I mean. My initial reaction would be also sort of adding it to, we talk a lot about transition, which is an important uh, part of it, and not only now investing into everything that's green, but we make, or might make more of an impact if we redirect the capital flow into brown stocks and to make them yeah, light, uh, uh, light brown, uh, we have a much larger impact than only to invest into what is dark green already, but uh, just this my view, um, can, can I pick on uh, Anna, uh, you again, maybe uh, to, to start, and uh, then hopefully the others can join in? Yeah, I mean, like, like hopefully, I mean, it's a good question, but hopefully also this assumption that we sort of, if you look at brown industries, that they might be more profitable from sort of the investor perspective. Uh, looking at the regulatory development, my, my assumption would be that we would cross a point at, at, at some stage in the near future where this is not doesn't hold true anymore. So. I think we will see a reversion. So that's one aspect. And then on the other hand, also, if you look at net zero transition, you're certainly hoping and looking at all these new technologies coming up, which also will change the overall picture. So from today, I mean, like, if you look at it today, I understand the question, but hopefully um, the picture will very look very different in, in 2030 already. Okay. Am I... Uh weigh in with a couple additional points one i would suggest that uh, oil won't become more scarce over the next 30 years given the focus on becoming more efficient as a whole right so uh, we know that we still need it but as technologies roll out and we become more efficient in our usage of energy that means that the oil reserves in and of themselves extend in the, this, the amount that they have relative to the consumption. And I think the, the other point to look at is from a profitability perspective, buying into companies when they're younger or in their infancy, right, bears out a higher potential reward than buying an established firm, right? So think of it as a firm in its uh, maturity profile. Uh, so. If you're buying in in the innovation stage, there's high risk, but if you ride it all the way through, right? If you invested in Microsoft in the 80s, right? Your returns today are worth substantially more. If you sign the uh, 
a, a shoe deal with Nike in the 80s, right? You're a billionaire today. So um, if you are investing in ESG today, right, over the long term, those companies will mature and adapt and grow in market cap and it will be more profitable. So the question is, what are you investing for? Are you investing to make returns over the next couple of years because you've got a short exit strategy and you just want to make 10% returns a year, 15% returns until you go on to a fixed income strategy? Or are you investing because you've got a much longer view? And, and, and those are different discussions than I think ESG. Thank you, Johan, but especially we continue on this uh, longer term focus um, because this is one of our next questions. How can the risk and compliance teams maybe truly advocate on the opportunities to ensure the business is finally making the switch to impact investment decisions um, for the longer term? I think it's about something risk appetite, right? You you run a stress, you play it back to the business, you show them what's driving the risk, right? In some in a format that makes sense to the business. Uh, a number of times in my experience in the industry, I have seen risk teams presenting risk to a business, but it's not translatable. It's in risk terms and it's not in business terms. And what you have to do is you have to develop what you think the risk is, but you have to be able to translate that and put it into direct terms of how the business operates, how they engage and interact with clients. If you can't do that, you're going to fail. So it's all about being able to say, okay, this is what you're doing. This is how this directly flows through what I've done to try to assess or capture or identify the risk. And here's the output. And then this is the judgment I've used to make it determining factor of the total risk appetite that I have today, right? And, and I think that's the most critical thing is you have to be speaking the same language, making it translatable. And, and I would say the whole reason the DCRO Institute exists is just what Johan had described. Um, you know, back when, back when the foundation of this was put in place was because boards didn't understand risk and risk people didn't understand how to speak board. Um, so the programs that we're running now are just about that, helping people understand how it is that you put this in the context of the way in which a board member thinks, which I, I said earlier, it's not about everything that can go wrong, it's about how do you achieve your goals. Um, and, and that's critical. So if we come in and we frame risk as about loss and about compliance, you've maybe, maybe got 20% of the value of understanding risk. You've brought 100% of the minds closed. And, and that's unfortunate. So I, I think, um, just a real quick comment, because I want Anna talk on this too. Um, in the last week, I've received a couple of calls from, from board members at listed companies here in the US, and they're about the same thing. It's about the SEC and climate. They weren't interested in this until this SEC regulation became live, or I shouldn't say live, but but now and it's uh, the comments are closed. That means they're interested only as a compliance exercise, and that's when we're losing. If we if we make it that, we've lost. We really have to turn this into something that makes the business better, because that's where board members are in their thinking. Anna, anything to add from your end? No, but you know, I, I fully agree, and this is, I think, what integration is about, that you really try to sort of communicate at the interfaces of the different departments and the business side and compliance and risk. And this is, it, it, it is extremely challenging, but I think it's extremely important. Thank you. Um, I think in the interest of time, um, I would rather come, let's say, to an, to an end and, and give a short summary of the things that I think we learned today. And already at this point in time, a very big thank you to our panelists. To summarize, um, I think ESG um, and the ESG risk management from a board perspective, it's definitely not a new aspect. Especially, there are lots of um, corporates out there who are really, really interested in the longer term value creation. And therefore, they have an interest on their own to take the right decisions for the future. However, and David pointed this out at the very beginning, the boards need the right tools to inform them and then to take also the right decisions based on them. And as we just discussed also in our Q&A, 
it's not only a compliance exercise, but it's really a business decision exercise. And it's not, you shouldn't fall short in terms of only looking at ESG from a compliance standpoint of view. ESG comes with a lot of opportunities. And Anna already said that there's lots of involvement and a huge involvement from the private sector needed. Um, we will potentially see definitely a huge increase of the assets under management, which will flow into the direction of ESG products, ESG funds. However, if this is going to the right way, or if this should go in the right way, transparency is needed. Transparency to manage the portfolios, transparency to manage the risks, also to differentiate between the innovation and the products investors are looking for. And for all this transparency, once again, data is key. Data is absolutely needed in order to um, achieve this transparency because only what you can measure, what you can quantify, you can manage at the end of the day. Over time, with these opportunities and with this innovation might come some potential risks occurring over the next few years after, let's say, the first start of ESG products um, are around. New investors might arise looking for opportunities to arbitrate across different risk classes, and this could then maybe bring new risks and maybe new bubbles, and Harald mentioned this in, in one of his questions, and we should uh, look out for them. Also taking into consideration that things like the black swan exist and companies should be prepared to take this into consideration. We discussed that the current models, the current technology is potentially not fully fit for purpose and not at the moment able to cover all aspects of ESG correctly. Johan mentioned that dynamic risk management um, is one of the aspects which could solve for this. You overall, I think it's fair to say we have to think differently about risks compared that we handled risks in the past and that this new area, where, era where we are currently in, the era of ESG, demands more from the risk management departments, demands more information so that boards and senior management can take at the end of the day the right decision. Ideally, of course, organizations should be changed in a way to be able to um, make use of the upside and of course avoid the downside. We discussed also that ESG might be a subset of G, namely governance, and that ESG is not the other way around, or G is not only the other way around, a subset of ESG. And that trust, and uh, David described the concept behind this, trust um, absolutely matters. Overall, I think it's fair to say financing of the transition of the economy and of the corporates is absolutely important because otherwise we will not be able to get there where we wanted to get, namely to a really green economy. However, this means that we really have to analyze the underlyings of the things that we invest in or that banks, asset managers, insurance companies invest in. They really have to analyze these crucially to really have a good understanding what you are really investing in. And last but not least, um, I think it's also very important to highlight that the EU and the US, but potentially also, of course, APEC, need to continue working together on this journey in really establishing global ESG standards so that at the end of the day, we will come to a, um, a greener economy and that this is what, what should be achieved with this overall ESG development. I can only say that um, the point that David made at the very end, um, the flip-flopping of politics, that this is an important aspect and that this hopefully not going to happen um, in the future. And that also the matters of climate and the transition risks are probably, properly being taken care of. With this, on behalf of Harold and myself, I would like to extend a very big thank you to our panelists, to Anna, to David and Johan for being with us today and sharing your expertise, your deep know-how and insights on ESG and in risk management. I would also like to thank you, our esteemed guests, for joining us at the webinar today. With this, I would like to wish everyone a great day and take care.